Welcome to our podcast, Schizophrenia, Three Moms in the Trenches. From the place where schizophrenia and real life collide. East Coast, West Coast, Middle America. With Miriam Feldman, Mindy Greiling, and Randy Kay. Finally, a place to talk about the truth. Welcome to episode 33 of Schizophrenia, Three Moms in the Trenches. Guess what? It's our one-year anniversary, you guys. I saw that, yeah. Hey, happy anniversary to us. Happy anniversary, yay! This is one year, and we started season two six weeks ago just because we had 25 episodes, and episode 26 seemed like a good time to start season two. But we're we're still going to celebrate big when we get to episode 100. So I'm very excited about tonight because in so many of our shows in the past, one of the many, many issues that comes up is what happens to my loved one after they leave the hospital? Where do they live? How can they redo their life? And in a moment, we're going to bring in Mary Guerrera, who has an answer, not without challenges, as we'll find out, but an answer that I have personally toured. And even my son is very excited about maybe someday taking a tour there. So I want to say that we're going to be talking about Fellowship Place and its supportive community fostering mental health. So if we're looking a little bit for solutions, this is the episode about that. Coming up, by the way, in the next two episodes, we'll be talking to a young man named Ryan who has schizophrenia and contacted me, having heard our podcast and said to me on his email and later on our phone chat, hearing your podcast was the first time I understood what my illness has done to my family and it's made me want to reach out. And so... We are very excited that Ryan's going to come on the show next week and talk to us about what it feels like to have schizophrenia. He seems to be doing well. He's going for his master's. So, uh, but he wants to tell us what it's like inside his head. And so that's very exciting. And after that, we'll be talking. Mindy, you want to say what the next episode is going to be about? uh, The next episode I'm excited about too. It's Sabah Muhammad, who leads a podcast for uh, people of Black, Indigenous, people of color. And that is, I'm sure, a lot of common issues and concerns that we all share. And then, but with the lens of what goes on in those communities that makes it, I think, even harder to deal with mental illness. So she's she does this for the Treatment Advocacy Center that she works for. Got a chance to meet her uh, three years ago before COVID. And uh, she's a delightful young woman, um, who I think everybody will learn from, including us. Okay, great. So we have coming attractions. We'll also be talking to the author of a new book about parenting difficult children. And so we have a a lot ahead. We're very, very excited. Also want to say that when I went onto our YouTube channel where we have 244 subscribers, I got this notice. It says, YouTube, new achievement. So those eyeballs, (laughs) the new achievement is we have 5,000 views. Oh, wow. So 5,000 people have viewed something on our YouTube channel and that, and it says, looks like your videos are getting more attention. So we're excited about that. Whether you're listening or watching, we're so glad to have you with us. Please share, please subscribe, please tell your friends about it. Uh, We are getting close to 20,000 downloads. As of five minutes ago, we were at 19,501. So yay. And welcome. So glad you're here. Mindy's gone on a cruise. Mimi, we, we, we've, had, we've had some time. So seriously, 30 second update, just real, real quick. Um, I'll start. We're doing okay. COVID has hit my son's group home. Fortunately, knock wood, they are quarantining the people who have it. And my son seems to be okay so far. And they're handling it quite well. But when the phone rang and I saw who it was, I'm like, oh no. And it was like, oh, it's only COVID. So it was like, (laughs) just COVID because anything else can go wrong when the phone rings. So that's my 30 second update. Mindy, you all survived the cruise or had a wonderful time? We survived the cruise, had a wonderful time, came back healthy. And the good news is our son, this is the first time we've left him since um, he's been really sick. He survived taking care of the cat. He opted not to go with us. We wish he would have. But since he didn't, we're so glad um, 
that he survived while we were gone because he's had big episodes other times when we were gone. So I kind of had PTSD to leave him, but he made it and we all made it. That's awesome. And Mimi, how are things in your Good. Coast Nick's household? Good, caregiver now has COVID. So we're now propelled into a whole thing with that, but he's doing well. And um, funny what you said about the phone call from, the, um, from his place. I got a phone call called from Nick recently, a text when I was in LA and it said, what's my address? And I looked at that and I thought, there's no way this is good. <laughs> he's either in custody or he's ordering something ridiculous to be delivered to his apartment. Oh my God. <laughs> and I shared it with the women that I was with. They didn't quite get it. I think mothers of sons with schizophrenia might get it better, but things are going well. Good. Why did he need the address? He was trying to get pizza delivered. Okay. <laughs> At least he was in normal, right? At least Just it call the pizza being delivered. I love it. That's awesome. Okay. So now that we have our quick updates and Mary's been listening, so you've got to meet, uh, uh, you know, meet us a little bit. Mary, you know me. But uh, this is Mindy and Mimi. We each have sons with schizophrenia. We've each written books about schizophrenia. We each continue to advocate for our sons and for ourselves and for our families. And I've invited you on because so many of us, families of people with any mental illness, wonder what to do after the hospital. After the hospitalization, what? Where, where do you go if they don't live with the family or they can't live with the family or it's not a good idea to live with the family? What would true support and community look like? What is possible? And I have to say that when my book came out 10 years ago, one of, one of my favorite bookings was getting to go to Fellowship Place in New Haven, Connecticut and take a tour of what looked to me like heaven on earth. I'm sure it isn't, but I mean, it just, I could imagine my son being happy in a place like that. And it, it is one of the most well thought out and respectful housing communities that I've seen. And so I'm just delighted to have um, the executive director, Mary Guerrera on to share the fellowship place story with us. Mary, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. And it's really nice to hear about all of your success on YouTube. Congratulations. Thank You're you. doing a great job getting the word out about mental health and what's working and what's not working and what we need more of. So thank you. Yes. So that's what we want to talk about, what we need more of. So I will just start by reading your mission statement straight off of your website, which is to serve adults living with mental illness by offering a full range of therapeutic support and rehabilitation services that promote independence, wellness, and a meaningful life. So Mindy's nodding her head, Mimi's nodding her head. So, you know, just tell us, you know, I would like to know what Fellowship Place is and, and also at some point, what drew you to this line of work? So tell us a bit about your history and Fellowship Place's history. Uh, well, I guess I'll start with my history. Um, I am a um, licensed clinical social worker, and I have been in social work um, my entire professional life, um, right from undergraduate school up until now. And I've held a variety of positions, um, you know, started out as a caseworker doing direct services, and then just, you know, as they say, worked my way up the ladder. Um, the, a lot of my early work was in child welfare and in preventive services, and I really became involved in community-based mental health, and in particular in working with people living with serious mental illnesses like schizophrenia um, back in 1990. And at that time, I met a pioneer, a really wonderful woman, um, who was a mother who had a son with schizophrenia. Um, and she established an organization in Greenwich, Connecticut called Pathways. And um, she overcame a lot of obstacles, as you can imagine, um, in Greenwich to try to open up a residence 
for people that were being discharged from the hospital. This was at the time when deinstitutionalization first started. Um, her name is Renee Bigler, and um, she does not take no for an answer. Uh, and um, we like she, her. <laughs> she overcame um, legal challenges, neighborhood challenges, NIMBY, all kinds of things to get this first um, group residence established in Greenwich. And um, she actually approached me about becoming the executive director of Pathways. And um, I accepted and, um, you know, we grew the program pretty significantly from just one house to four houses. And then we added other programs as well. And the one thing that I learned about working with Renee Bigler and working in Greenwich um, was that um, you can't take no for an answer and you really need um, the voice of parents and family members, um, you know, working together to overcome the stigma and the um, misinformation that's out there about mental illness. Um, and after being at Pathways uh, for about a decade and a half, I had the opportunity to come to New Haven, um, mostly because um, at that time, Fellowship Place was at a transition where they were um, getting involved more in housing. And because of the experience that I had had developing housing in Greenwich, I think that they were you know, very interested in bringing me on board at Fellowship Place. So that's how I got into it. Um, a lot of similarities between Pathways and Fellowship Place. Um, again, because Fellowship was like Pathways was started by um, essentially lay people, you know, people like you all, um, people really? who, yeah, yeah, people who just saw a need, um, understood a little bit about mental illness because of experiences. And, and just the, the most significant thing that I have found in my career is how you can't just rely on the government. You can't just rely on professionals. You really need a partnership between um, people on the ground who are actually, you know, dealing with mental illness in a very personal way every day to kind of like push the boundaries um, and advocate for what's needed um, from a very practical perspective. Because a lot of times, if you're just looking at the clinical providers, you know, they're looking at the clinical issues, the medical issues, government is looking at um, how to save money. Um, and, you know, sometimes government and the medical profession is very rigid. Um, so sometimes people like family members, people like you on the ground can help push the boundaries and have a really positive impact on how services are developed. And again, I've experienced that firsthand in my career, first at Pathways and now at Fellowship Place. So are you a family us? member, Mary? No, I, I do not. I, I, I do have some distant family members that had um, problems. I tell this story a lot. Um, I had a woman in my family who, um, was an aunt, but not really sure why she was an aunt, but we always considered her an aunt. And she would periodically um, go away. And when she came home, she would have all of these knitted things that she'd made, um, scarves, socks, um, all kinds of things that you know she would give away to other people in the family. And I just thought it was really cool that we were getting all these nice colorful sweaters and vests that she had knitted. And years later, when I worked for um, the Connecticut Department of Children and Families, um, shortly after I got out of school, I happened to be on the phone one evening with my mother. And I told her that the next day I was leaving very, very early because I had to be at Connecticut Valley Hospital in Middletown for a meeting. And she said, oh, you're going there? That's where Filomena always was. And Philomena was the woman that would go away and then come back months later with all of these knitted goods. And I never knew that she had a mental illness or that she was 
in a state psychiatric hospital. I just thought she was going away on trips right. um, until my mother shared that with me that that night. Wow. So tell us what I'd love to know, because I've seen it, but it's been a while. Tell us about the program. Tell us what would happen to someone like one of our sons if they wanted housing. How would they get in? And once they were in and there was a space, because we'll talk. I want to talk about the program, some success stories and what challenges you're facing with with funding and everything else. So let's talk. What's the program like? What do you offer? Yeah. So first, let me tell you what we don't offer, because a lot of times when people think mental health, they think about psychiatrists, psychologists, medications, um, clinicians. So we don't provide any of those traditional clinical services. What we strive to do is to address all of the other aspects of a person's life that really present challenges for people living with a serious mental illness. So we have four core programs. Um, We have a permanent supported housing program, which um, is comprised of four separate apartment buildings, um, all nearby um, to our main campus. And in those Pro, in those apartment buildings, we provide support services, casework services that help people be successful in housing. Um, we do a lot of skill building, um, a lot of counseling about how to structure your day, um, what other things you might do besides just stay in your apartment, staring at four walls or, or looking at um, your computer. Um, The rents in those four apartment buildings are all subsidized through project-based contracts that we have with the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development, HUD, or um, the New Haven Housing Authority. So in the housing program, we're addressing two very basic needs that a lot of the people that we're um, talking about tonight um, have. One is they need affordable housing because most of them are living on fixed incomes from social security disability um, or some other government program. And secondly, in order to really be successful, they need support from somebody who can help them with the day to day. Um, And thirdly, probably just as important, they need um, supportive neighbors. They need to be part of a community of, of an, you know, be part of a, a, a network. Um, you know, a lot of times people that find apartments that are just random, you know, out there in the community somewhere, um, run into problems because the other people in the apartment building think that they're odd or are afraid of them. Or if they see them on the front porch talking to themselves, you know, they, they just don't get it. Um, landlords get upset if the apartment's not kept up the way it's supposed to be kept up um, or the way the landlord expects it to be kept up. But in a supported housing program, like the ones that we operate, um, you know, everybody in the building has been there, you know, and, and maybe they're doing well now, but they remember when they weren't doing so well. So if somebody starts to have problems, they are oftentimes right there for the person who's not doing well, supporting them and and helping them get through tough times. And um, the casework staff is also there on a regular basis and is oftentimes the first person or persons to see that, hey, you know, this, this person is starting to decompensate and we need to intervene. And then also with just the day to day stuff, making sure the apartment is clean, that the garbage is thrown out. Um, that that people have meaningful, positive things to do. Um, Tell us about the, isn't there like a central sort of clubhouse thing? That was something that really- Could could I ask a question about the housing though, before we go on to the clubhouse? Sure. So when, um, because this is to me utopia, we always, in Minnesota, which is the state I'm from, um, we have a lot of 90 day programs, we're really enamored with community care, but it really translates into often 90 day programs. And that's just a drop in the bucket. So this permanent supportive housing that you have to me is utopia for people with 
serious mental illness who just aren't doing well. You know, FYI, my son is in uh, an apartment and he's mostly in our house because he's lonesome there. But when you say permanent, does that mean lifelong? And then when you say HUD, um, it's, it's not Section 8, it's kind of HUD housing we used to have, but that we don't have any, we don't get new HUD projects usually anymore. We have a couple that I know of, one really close to my house, but it's a form of housing that I don't think is uh, being propagated. And I'd like to know if I'm accurate on that, this when it comes to Connecticut, and then why do you think um, it is that this is not the favored model when so many people like our sons need it? So those are both um, really good questions. And yes, um, our housing is considered permanent. So people can be there a year, they could be there 20 years. In fact, I have a couple of residents that have been in our building for 20 years. Um, the, all of the residents have a lease um, and um, they have to abide by the terms of the lease. Um, but as long as they do that, um, you know, they can be there as long as they want or as short a time as they want. So it's, there's a lot of choice there. Um, in the last several years, um, there um, has been a move away at the HUD level from um, site-based housing like ours. Um, so the funding that helped us create some of the buildings that we created in Greenwich and, and that we have at my agency here in New Haven, um, is, it's not really there anymore. Um, so it's hard to build new housing like what we've got now. Um, the move really has been more towards um, vouchers that people can use to rent apartments, you know, anywhere that has an opening and, and landlord will rent to them. Um, so one of the things that I was going to um, throw out to all of you, because you're interested in advocacy, is to advocate for more funding to be able to develop projects that combine all of the elements that I talked about, affordability, support services, and a peer support network. Why because, do you think they moved away from that? Well, because it's expensive. Um, you know, the one of the projects that um, I developed here in New Haven um, is an 18-unit apartment building. Um, it was a pretty old, deca de de decrepit um, building that we were able to purchase, but we had to do like a total renovation. Um, to create the 18 units that we have. And it cost about three and a half million dollars to do that. And where did that money come from? It was HUD money. It was It was through a program called, um, it was a Section 811 program. Um, and um, I did a Section 8, I did two Section 811s in Greenwich and then a Section 811 here in New Haven. But there are no more Section 811 um, dollars out there. But I think it's a model that works. I think it works a lot better than having people in scattered sites in apartments where um, you know they may have friendly neighbors and they may not. I mean, I that is the agree. thing that strongly that, agree. Yeah, we, we and that when you say peer support system that is the thing that opens my heart to that. When I toured a fellowship place 10 years ago now, I don't know if this is still there, but I remember a clubhouse. I remember a pool table. I remember people coming in and, you know, people smoking, you know, I don't love it, but people smoke, having someone to have a cigarette with in front of the clubhouse. I remember a cafeteria. I don't know if that's still there where people could learn skills. And I know when my son left his group home 10 years ago and was promoted to his own apartment, it was a disaster. It was exactly like what you said. The neighbors thought he was weird. His bicycle got stolen. There were bed bugs. I mean, he was paying his, his bill, but he had no, he was lonely. 
he was so lonely. He didn't, I mean, luckily he was, he was doing his best. He was trying to go to school. He was working part-time. It was going to uh, anonymous meetings, but it was a terrible experience. And I think the loneliness had a lot to do with him refusing his meds and eventually getting hospitalized again. And when I saw what you had there with yoga classes and when there was a ceiling filled with artwork, I remember that, that people- It's, all still, it's all still there, Randy. It's still <laughs> there. So to, for, for my son to have the option to not cook his own lunch and go down to the cafeteria and break bread with somebody else, that was just something I'm like, that's, we want that. So uh, tell us about the clubhouse. Tell us yeah. about, you know, all of those things. And then, you know, how hard is it to get a bed? Um, mm-hmm. So so we all have basic needs, right? Um, think about, you know, your own life and what's important to you and what makes your life meaningful. And, you know, most people, if you ask those questions, will say, my family, my friends, my hobbies, my job. Um, And people who are living with a serious mental illness have all of those same needs. And the purpose of our clubhouse program is to help um, people fulfill those needs um, in a very um, non-judgmental, low demand, um, very warm, nurturing environment. And what's really special and I think perfect about the clubhouse is that it's open seven days a week. It's open from early morning till till late at night. It was open on Christmas. It was open on New Year's Eve. So people can always come in and find other people that are going through the same kinds of challenges that they're going through to just kind of, sometimes people will just sit next to each other and never exchange a word, Um, but it's okay because at least you know there's other people around. And um, we have a variety of different activities in the clubhouse. There's really something for everybody. Um, Probably one of the most popular things is our expressive arts program. So we've got a variety of different levels of art classes and art groups that people can participate in. We have um, a writer's group where people get together and they write poetry, they write essays. And then once every three or four months, they publish a literary journal that's made up of you know, all of the work that they've, they've done. Um, we also have a music group that has morphed into a band called The Ships. And um, the ships perform at all of our special events. They did a great job at our holiday party um, last month. Um, And and again, these are just things that help people feel like they're a part of something, that they have something that they can enjoy. Um, We also have a dance group um, that meets once a week and it's exercise, It's dancing, it's socializing, but for a lot of people, it also helps them concentrate because in order to be able to learn the new dance steps, they really have to pay attention. They need to be able to concentrate. And as you know, for a lot of people um, with mental illness and especially schizophrenia, they have a hard time with organizing their thoughts. And, And we find that with the dance group, if they really want to learn the dances, they've really got to pay attention and it's, it's great. Um, but we have yoga, we have exercise, um, we have cooking classes, um, we've got movie nights, we've got um, s- s- current events, um, all kinds of discussion groups. And then we have more clinically oriented groups as well. We have a group um, about hearing voices, Um, We have groups about building healthy, positive relationships. Um, So there's really something for everyone. And what's really, really outstanding about the clubhouse model, as opposed to a medical model um, in a, you know, an IOP program or a, a day treatment program at a hospital or a clinic, is that people can come in and say, you know what? I don't really want to do anything. I'm just going to come and hang out 
and that's fine, no pressure. Or they can come in and look at our program calendar and say, well, you know, yeah, I hear voices. I think I should go to the hearing voices group or, you know, I like to play the guitar. Do you think I could go to music group? So they get to choose what they're going to do, when they're going to do it and how they're going to do it. And if they really just want to come and sit, that's okay too. And, you know, we really feel that having them come in and even if they're just sitting and observing, eventually something's going to click and they're going to get involved in something. We had International Clubhouse <clears throat> executive director on for one of our guests that Randy invited him recently. And is your clubhouse a, a certified clubhouse, international clubhouse or not? Yeah, no. So we've, we, we really... Um, we, we've taken what we consider the best from the clubhouse model and added other things. So, you know, there's some similar, we're not a certified clubhouse and, um, you know, we, we borrowed some of their ideas, but, but, but not all. We've added a lot of our, our own stuff, in particular, some of the clinical groups that we run um, are not groups that you would probably find in your um, typical clubhouse, but we have found that they're very, very helpful for people that are at that at that stage in their recovery. And so just so I'm clear, clear, oh, I'm sorry. Um, so I this it, and I use the word clubhouse, but it wasn't like an official. It's sort of a central gathering place. You know what we you know what we call it? We call what? it um, a social rehab center. Um, that's like the official name, and then the unofficial name is the clubhouse. Gotcha. But it's only for people in your housing, right? Only for residents? No. Oh. no. Um, oh. So it, it is open to everybody who lives in our apartments, but it's also open to people that um, are living with family members, um, living in their own apartments somewhere in the greater New Haven area. We also take people from group homes and transitional housing. So it's really open to anyone in the greater New Haven area who um, is, you know, living with a mental illness and it's, it's really any mental illness. So we have uh, many people, of course, who, who have schizophrenia, but we also have a lot of people with substance abuse issues, post-traumatic stress issues, anxiety disorders. So um, it's really, it, it's open to a broad range of people. And we probably see in any given day about 120 to 150 people. That's dropped off a lot, of course, in the last couple of years because of COVID, but those are really our pre-COVID numbers. Um, and people, some people come and they stay for breakfast and they don't leave until after dinner. Um, and some people just come um, for particular groups or activities that they want to participate in. Some people just spend the afternoons with us. It really is, um, it, it runs the gamut. Um, okay. And we do a lot to try to help people get to know the community and get involved in the community so that they're not just always at our clubhouse. So um, we have a volunteer group, well, we have several volunteer groups where one of our peer support specialists will has set up these um, group volunteer activities and people can sign up to be a part of one of those groups. And um, they do work at an animal shelter. They help pack meals at the downtown soup kitchen. Um, what else? There was one other Oh, the Yale Sustainable Garden. That's a, a, a gar garden at Yale University. So again, this is a way for people to give back to the community and to be a part of not only the fellowship community, but the broader community as well, which, you know, again, a lot of our, um, our, our folks have a problem with that um, because they tend to isolate, their social skills aren't great. And you know, we try to help improve their lives in those areas. You know, and, and we, we say we have a lot of fun, but we have fun with a purpose. I love it. I'm watching Mimi's face and I know she wants to talk. So go ahead. Me? Yeah. Well, I just I mean, I may be jumping ahead here, but I mean the obvious question is 
how can we have this in every state? I mean, why is this? This is what we need everywhere. This is, and why did this happen here and not elsewhere? And how do we do it? I mean, this is what we need. So a lot of it has to do with um, funding and advocacy. Um, you know, when I hear politicians talk about mental health reform and um, investing more money in mental health dollars, they are typically referring to uh, more hospital beds, uh, more uh, outpatient clinics, um, all of the medical model kinds of services. Um, and we need all of those services. However, as you all know, and, and you're, you know more than anybody else because you're living it every day with your sons and daughters, there needs to be something for people in between all of those medical appointments. Because in order to really have a positive, meaningful life, it's not just seeing your doctor once a month or once every couple of months. It's not just taking medication. You need a lot more. And, and that's where places like Fellowship Place come in. We are addressing all of the challenges and issues that people living with mental illness um, have that are not really addressed by the psychiatric community. And um, probably the psychiatric community is not in the best position to address those issues. Housing, employment, um, daytime structure, those, those things are really, really important, but they don't really come under the medical model. And I think that there needs to be a lot more advocacy um, and community um, awareness about the whole gamut of things that people living with mental illness need to really um, have positive, healthy lives, that it's not just the medical stuff. For sure. Um, what what so advocacy groups are helping you the most? Are there any groups you could name? Does, is NAMI helpful with this advocacy? Uh, NAMI is helpful. Um, but I also think that um, parents are very, very helpful. Um, the consumers themselves are very helpful. Um, we try to get our consumers involved in letter writing campaigns and testimony in front of the legislature to talk about what really has helped them in their recovery. And, you know, oftentimes people will say, oh, you know, I take my medication and that's really helped me. But what really stands out when you talk with the person um, in recovery is what's helped them is having a place to go to every day, having a decent place to live, having good friends that I can talk to at 10 o'clock at night if I'm feeling anxious or I'm starting to hear voices. Those things really, really stand out. Having a job, even if it's just a volunteer job or a part-time job, that is very, very meaningful. Um, so that's what we need more of. We need to expand um, the way we think of mental health and mental health services. It's not just the clinical stuff. It's a lot of these non-traditional kinds of things that we do at Fellowship Place um, that I think can really make a difference. And in the long run, these non-traditional things help the whole community because you're, you see, People are gonna go less back and forth in the hospital. They're gonna have um, fewer relapses. And in the end, that's, that's, that's good for all of us. And happier lives. Just and so we know, lives. yeah, we're, we're just, we have about 10 minutes left, believe it or not. That's so it. I, so. One more thing I wanted to say in, in it, you know, the, the investment in mental health services varies from state to state. Um, in Connecticut, we're very, very fortunate. Um, we have a, um, it could be better. There's always room for improvement, but I think that the state has done a pretty good job of investing in community-based services like the ones we have at Fellowship Place. And um, our, our budget at Fellowship Place is about um, $3 million a year. About 75% of that budget does come from the state of Connecticut. And we have to raise the rest privately. And we do that through 
annual appeals, special events, foundation writing. Um, but you know, the state, at least here in Connecticut, is our biggest funding source. That's good to know. I want to know as a parent, even though, even though it's not a medical model, is there support for my, my son taking his meds every day? And how long is your waiting list for a bed? That's the question I Mimi <laughs> asked earlier, and I'm waiting to hear the answer. And I'm yeah, so there is, a waiting, <laughs> there is a waiting list in all of our housing. Um, because it is permanent housing, we don't have a lot of turnover. Um, and um, last year, we filled a vacancy in um, our Section 811 project, which is our newest project. Um, that project opened up in 2010. And, with, and we only have 18 units in the project. And within just um, a, a day or so of, of taking applications, we had enough applications for um, probably three buildings. Um, and last year when we filled that vacancy, um, right around this time of year last year, the person who got the, um, the, the vacant unit was someone that had actually been waiting since we first started taking applications back in 2010. Oh, so my, my conclusion there that you said Connecticut does a pretty good job, but you know, this is what I find in all states that I know anything about, and that is including Minnesota. We say we're doing a good job because we have a little of this, a little of that, a little of that. But when you look at the waiting lists, I don't think any state is doing a good job, uh, including Connecticut. If you have somebody that waited 10 years to get in or more. We do a good job with what we have, but people can't get into these places. And, and, and as I said, you know, the, there isn't a lot of money to develop new housing. Um, mm -hmm. And I think, you know, one of the biggest challenges is that um, there isn't that money to develop new housing. And, and that's a, a very important advocacy point that people need to make. Programs have waiting lists. It's considered permanent housing, which means there isn't going to be a lot of turnover. Mm -hmm. So we really need, um, you know, more dollars made available on the federal level. Right. Um, They're the ones that have really dropped the ball. The states, Minnesota is doing a really good job with affordable housing, but the federal government, um, you know, since the great society has given up on this for some reason, we can't get section eight. We don't get HUD money anymore. I mean, what has happened to our federal government? That's where the advocacy is really falling short. And yeah. that that we could talk a half an hour about that. And I just want to tell please, you. About no, I want because we have five minutes left and I want to hear the points you want to make because we want to know how how families can help. Yeah. And I'm, I'm also just curious, um, just real quickly, do, uh, going back to my first question, is there support for taking medication daily or a place where someone like, okay, so that's part yeah. of. So we, um, we certainly encourage people to take medication. We cannot require them to take medication, um, but we provide prompts about taking medication. We provide education about why taking their medication is important. And we, um, if someone really needs someone to be there and administer the meds for anyone, we will um, work with visiting nurses Great. who will come in to the apartments and help with that. We also have visiting nurses that come to the clubhouse and um, you know make sure that people take their medication, um, especially for people that are early risers and get to the clubhouse really early the nurses will actually come to the clubhouse and do medications at the clubhouse. Um, so, so that's how we handle the medications. Um, okay. I do wanna tell you that in addition to the clubhouse and housing, we have career services, we have employment programs and education programs for those um, individuals that are ready to think about going back to school or, or getting a job and um, the last program is probably the program that's growing the most these days, believe it or not, is our homeless drop-in program. So, you know, you know, and 
everyone should know that you know an overwhelming majority of the people who are homeless have a mental illness. Mm-hmm. You know, the, the folks that we see out on the streets tend to be people that um, suffer from a serious mental illness, are disconnected from family, disconnected from services, um, and are living on the streets. So we have a daytime drop-in program um, where homeless people can come in and take care of their basic needs like showers, food, laundry. Um, And then we have counselors who are available to um, engage them and help connect them with other services when they're ready, whether it be psychiatric care, medical care, uh, housing, you know, whatever. Um, so I think, and, and lately, um, in the last couple of years, we've really seen a big increase in the number of people coming to the homeless drop-in program. And many of them are in denial about their mental illness or their substance abuse problem, but um, it's pretty obvious when um, the intake person Um, assesses their situation that even though they may be denying um, a problem that they have one. Mm -hmm. Yeah. It's something we've discussed a lot. Mimi, I'm going to throw the last question to you if you have one, since Mindy and I have spoken more. I've had people, you know, people reach out to me all the time and I know a couple of people in particular who have said, you know, who wanted to do this parents who are fed up and frustrated and, I, I know a particular woman in California who's been trying for a long time. She just said, okay, let's just find 10 parents who can afford to do this and buy an apartment building and do this ourselves. But it's a very difficult thing to do on your own because first of all, you know, this woman had a lot of resources and most people are not going to be able to kick in a bunch of money to buy an apartment building. Is there any sort of map or guidebook or it's, you know, how do we learn how to get this going in other places? Because obviously this is what we need. Yeah. Um, I have to say that um, you should really maybe think about at some point getting Renee Bigler on um, because Renee Bigler, you know, of course, um, you know, had resources. She had friends with resources, um, but she can and should write the guidebook. Um, mm-hmm. And if you talk to her, tell her, I'll help her write the guidebook. But yeah, she, we need um, she, you know, she saw a need. She bought a building um, to develop it into housing for um, people with mental illness, immediately ran into a lot of um, NIMBY um, problems, mm-hmm. um, but she stuck with it and um, overcame legal challenges and um, put together a nice group of professionals and friends to um, grow her agency. Um, and Renee, Renee's primary interest was always housing. Um, you know, as the agency in Greenwich grew, um, you know, other things were added, but her primary interest was always housing. And she, she can really write the guidebook. She was doing permanent, affordable um, housing for people with mental illness before any of the government or um, other policy folks even, you know, knew what it was. So Renee didn't know the name. She didn't know the name permanent supported housing. She didn't you make that. She didn't make that up. She just knew that people needed a decent place to live. And um, she worked hard to get her programs off the ground. Yeah. She is really a remarkable woman, tough, um, but accomplished a lot. I learned a lot from her. Well, so we will was- definitely reach out to her. We yeah. definitely will. I, I, I can't believe how, how quickly the time has, has gone. I, I want to know where people can send money to you. <laughs> <laughs> or the, the I'll link. take it. <laughs> yeah, you know, any any links? Uh, obviously, I'm going to put your uh, fellowshipplace.org. That'll be in the in the show description. But in case someone's not reading the show description, tell us any links for more information. Um, anything you'd like us to know in the last minutes? Yeah. So our website is www.fellowshipplace.org. 
Um, there is a donation page on the website, so you can just click on donation if you'd like to support what we're doing. Um, and um, again, advocacy is so important. Raising awareness is so important. In addition to housing and making sure that the right kind of housing is available, um, I think to um, push the politicians and the medical community to um, think about mental health more broadly, not just in terms of the medical model is important, and um, also to push research around how to help people who are suffering from serious mental illness and especially schizophrenia um, develop more insight. Um, it's that inability to develop insight that really um, stands in the way sometimes of people taking medication and following through with treatment. And I think we need to come up with more psychosocial interventions that will help build on insight. Wow. Those are all very, very important issues. We have had um, Javier Amador on talking about anosognosia and a lot of these issues, but you have presented us with possibility and that is so important. And I thank you so much for coming on. Any other last words, Mimi or Mindy, other than a thank you? Just thank you. I will say thank you. Thank you very much for giving us a, a goal that we can work for in all of our states. Mary, thank you so much. Thank you so much for coming on. It was a pleasure to be on. I, I really um, am grateful for the time to talk about what we do and hopefully our paths will cross again and um, I'd be happy to come back anytime. Hey, thanks for joining us for this episode of Schizophrenia, Three Moms in the Trenches with Randy Kay, Mindy Greiling, and Miriam Feldman. To get in touch with us or to learn more about our books, please visit our websites at miriam-feldman.com, mindygreiling.com, or randyk.com.